earlier project we started 2012 where uh, acp fg and university of adelaide were the lead from okay. dr tim sutton tim sutton from there he was lead and the partners were melbourne university and then university of western australia professor tim colmer who is the right now deputy vice chancellor of the uwa mm -hmm. and then second round we started in 2017 again with tim sutton and tim colmer and last year we got another round of proposal with uwa where dr siddiq mm -hmm. and then dr dave edwards and then the lead is dr harvey miller mm -hmm. who is expert in metabolomics proteomics kind yeah, of thing. Harvey miller. so yeah. it's been eight years my session with australia and they got an opportunity to visit so a couple it, of times it's all about chickpea yeah it's all about chickpea all about chickpea, all about chickpea. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, you will be surprised. For me, it's 15 years of chickpea now. I've been working my doctoral okay. also was on chickpea. Okay. With my doctoral thesis also I worked on chickpea. That time I started coming to Ikrisat, and okay. then uh, just after my complete my PhD work, Rajiv gave me an opportunity. I joined Ikrisat, and then for past almost nine years I'm here, mm -hmm. spending time. So, in... so you are into functional genomics. I'm only into genomics, no. genomics and molecular into genomics, biology. genomics and molecular mm -hmm. biology. Okay. So that makes part of everything, but functional genomics have become that become too okay, specific. Okay, because I know one guy from NMPGR. He is a he is like an expert in making uh, chickpea transgenics, which I have heard it's very difficult to crack. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, because I'm a rice person, so yeah. I find rice itself so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I was like chickpea. Oh my goodness, <laughs> who will do that? For chickpea. People are claiming, but as of now, there are no reports. In fact, okay. one of our colleague at Ikrisat, Dr. Pooja Bhatnagar Mathur, yeah, she's I, also worked on chickpea transgenics. Uh -huh. And then, like one you mentioned the NIPGR, mm -hmm. and one lady, Sumita Acharji, I think in the so industry. He is from uh, Dr. Sabeta Bhatia's. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Dr. Sabeta Bhatia, we have worked in this earlier ASF project. She was one of the partner in with from India. Okay. NIPGR together with ICR, IRI, and we we were partner from India. Mm -hmm. And that, from NIPJ, Dr. Sabeta Bhatia, Dr. Mukesh Jain, these guys were associated with Because them. we have a handful of scientists working yeah. on chickpea assets, so uh, at least we know about them who, who is working yeah. on chickpea. Not now, not now. It, if but earlier it was back, when then, I was doing my PhD, yeah. uh, yes, uh, it So was. where did you did your PhD from? I did from ICGB. Okay. The neighboring institute uh, yeah, of yeah. NIPG. <laughs> no, because uh, when I started 2006 or 5, I, it was difficult to manage the thing because there was no markers, yeah. nothing was available. Yeah, yeah. So it was a challenge at how you start working. Whatever I had initially, Rajiv's group published something, some ESTs that time, 2007, 2009 paper, that BMC genomic. Mm -hmm. If you see before that, there was nothing, only a couple yeah, of hundred markers. That is what I'm SR saying. Like it's, it's quite, uh, still, I would say, quite new. Okay. Yeah. And if you see last 10 years, Rajiv took a lead and now mm -hmm. it's at the same level where at least rice are there, if not ahead. Mm -hmm. Because if you see rice is the largest and community of researchers, yeah. if you see, the whole yeah. entire world is working on the rice. Yeah. And chickpea, very few. Mm -hmm. But now from... we have many protein enthusiasts coming up. So I think it will very soon take up a good lead. Lead, but another thing to lead, you need the money also. <laughs> which is a challenge. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because if you, when you talk about this chickpea, chickpea is mainly India specific crop, more than 60% production comes from So maybe from you, it's difficult for you to tell the committee members and why you need to do so much in chickpea, is it? Indian case? people does, but the issue comes that when we talk about this, although it needs to change now, and that's yeah. one of the things I'll be presenting today also. So people mm -hmm. are mainly going for this cereal based diets. And okay. the government also focus mainly on the wheat, rice, and all those. Nobody cares, mm -hmm. okay, what is happening to the nutrition. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so if you see recently, last two tricky. years back, even government of yeah. India pushed for this, making pulses as part of the midday meal. Mm -hmm. At least kids and women, they should be eating more pulses, including chickpea, because these are very nutritious things, especially yeah. if women are pregnant women, is very good. Mm -hmm. it, it comes a big way. It will reduce the number of supplements as a pregnant woman, because I am father of two kids. I have seen my wife eating those tablets, that folic acid and all those things. Mm -hmm. If you focus majorly on chickpea, we have chickpea has potential to replace those tablets. If you eat one bowl of chickpea every day, that's mm -hmm. very good. Then. That's good. So let's hope people let's will hope start thinking. About 
no it will definitely change the way people are thinking about their health especially yeah. during this covid times i think it will definitely bring a positive change how yeah. people are eating healthy yeah. but we need to make public aware also <laughs> yes, nobody knows that, that that that's our responsibility i yeah. think this is a Because scientist responsibility I, like i said i'm working on chickpea for last 15 years but few years back i only got to know that chickpea is so rich in beta carotene for which mm-hmm. rice had to develop a gm golden rice, rice. yeah the gm mm-hmm. rice but mm-hmm. if you see golden rice one chickpea mm-hmm. has more beta carotene than golden rice one all the golden rice mm-hmm. two has higher than this but that's a gold gm mm-hmm. if people eat normal chickpea they'll get more beta carotene than after eating the golden rice so that's something we need to push to people yeah definitely I think we are live on YouTube. Ah uh, yes, we are yeah, in live. Start. But we, I, I also Twitch. Sir, I also Twitch uh, uh, and tag for uh, you and others. I think mm-hmm. not you and uh, Rajiv Basne, Chris Ed, Gobi. Whatever yeah. you you tagged last day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I find your tag and I also tag. Yeah. <laughs> Because unfortunately last. few week couple of weeks been so busy i could not put it more on my thing okay. this nsf deadline was there so i was working on some proposals okay. just yesterday the deadline was over so i was doing that thing else okay no sir yeah. we got uh, enough <laughs> i think we got, we got enough uh, response let's yeah. see okay so give me one minute i just sure, sure. finished the facebook uh, yeah. otherwise everything is set mm so i have to tweet your tweet Shall we start? Welcome to audience. No. Yes. Yes. Hello. officially started yes i just uh yeah okay everything is okay jacinta are you okay yeah. okay uh welcome everyone today we are going to start our 16 webinar in this race we have a dr manish rupival from ecrisat Jacinta will introduce him. Neha, collect the, your question from the YouTube chat box. Soma in, uh, interviewed him and also collect your question. And today there is a little bit changes. We wanted to uh, wanted to stop the pseudo attendance in a live webinar. Our webinar uh, is started now. It will end around twelve thirty and more. So that within that time you have to apply feedback for the your certificates. we will give you the link during the question answer round don't asking so many time for the link we definitely give the link at the appropriate time jasinta thanks i welcome you i welcome you all to today's webinar organized by bioengine bioengine is a non-profit online organization created to promote plant research worldwide we are very happy to organize plant research webinars that are free for the whole world For today's webinar we have received a huge response of around 3500 registrations. We welcome all the viewers and thank them for their interest in bioengine. 
please keep your questions ready for the question and answer round at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions related to today's talk in the YouTube comment box. You can apply for a certificate of participation via the feedback link and the password will be provided after the presentation. Submission of the feedback form is mandatory to receive a certificate. The feedback form link will be provided only in the YouTube chat box by the host. It will not be available on the BioEngine website or anywhere else. Please visit our website to know more about BioEngine and our initiatives. The topic for today's webinar is Integrating Genomics for Accelerating the Rate of Genetic Gain for Chickpea Improvement by Dr. Manish Rur sorry, Dr. Manish Rukuwal. Uh, Dr. Manish Rukuwal is a senior scientist in the genomics and molecular breeding at the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi Arid Tropics, or ICRISAT, based in Hyderabad, India. He is also associated with the Institute of Agriculture at the University of Western Australia as an adjunct associate professor. With a basic background in molecular genetics and applied genomics, Manish has over 15 years of research experience. At the core of his work is the improvement of crop productivity of legumes in marginal environments using modern genetics and breeding approaches, including genomic selection and genome-wide association studies. Manish has a strong interest in the area of modern breeding approaches, such as genomic selection and next generation sequencing-based resequencing and low-cost genotyping for enhancing the use of markers in routine breeding. He is known for leading the efforts in developing cost-effective genotyping platforms, enabling the use of markers in routine breeding programs. His expertise are genomics, forward breeding, next generation sequencing, modern breeding approaches such as genomic selection and marker assisted backcrossing. He was awarded the DST Inspire Faculty Award by the Government of India in June 2015. He is involved in many editorial activities, which include journals like Springer, the Plant Genome Journal, which is published by the Crop Society of America, and Frontiers in Plant Science. He is a reviewer for international journals like the Plant Biotechnology Journal, Scientific Reports, PLOS One, theoretical applied genetics and DNA research. We are honored to have him with us today. I now request Dr. Manish to please share his slides and begin your presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Asunta. Maybe let me share my screen. Yes, sir. Can you see it? Perfect, yes. Somehow I cannot share it, see it. Maybe. So is it possible? I'm not sure. Is it possible? Right, Shubha? Uh, yes, but uh, there is a uh, there is an option in the next slide. I think it it. Uh, ha, yes, yes. Now, now it's okay. Now it's fine, sir. Okay. Thanks, Shubha, and thanks, Team Bioengine, for this opportunity for this talk, and let. Pleased to be here and meeting so effective team of you, hardworking people. And I saw from the list of registrants, you have very good reach globally, not in India or in neighboring. And several people from several countries are, I'm hoping they are joining this thing. And today I'll be presenting about our efforts on integrated genomics for accelerating the rate of genetic gain for chickpea. So as told by thing I'm Manish Rukhiyal. I'm a senior scientist at Ipsiset. I mainly work on chickpea. In general, I work for less some of the legumes, but majorly my focus have been the chickpea. Some of the people who wants to know about the work, they can follow on the Twitter. They can email me. My email is there. Some of the questions are, you are not able to, although I'll try to answer all the questions here, but if some questions are left, they can email me. I'll be happy to address those things. Before I start my research work, let me give a brief about the institute where I work. If 
ICRITET, International Crop Research Institute for semi arid Tropics. It's one of the CGI's institute which works and we feel that we believe from ICRITET that, that all the people have a right to nutrition food and a better livelihood. We work with a vision of a prosperous food secure and resident island tropic. Our mission at ICRITET is to overcome poverty, poverty, overcoming hunger, reducing malnutrition, and preventing environment degradation. If you see, ICRITET is based at in Asia with the headquarters in India, and then several countries, ESA, Eastern Southern Africa, and WCA, Western Central Africa. So we have been working this location together with the these respective countries based on the country strategies, addressing the global issues of the hunger, malnutrition, and when you see the equipment location, you will see that why equipment become important. So if you see global hunger crisis from the last year, 2019 stats, this area, if you talk about this sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, they are at the stage of serious situation where still hunger, although so much efforts have been made by several agencies, but still a lot of effort needs to be made. And when we talk about the ICRISET, ICRISET works on six mandate crops, three legumes, chickpea, pigeon pea, groundnut, and three cereals, palmerate, sorghum, and finger millet. All these crops are very high in nutrition, and they can survive in very arid areas without much rain requirement or water requirement. They are ideal target to address the global hunger issues in these regions. And when I talk about the global hunger crisis, these days, it's not about the giving the food. Rather, when we talk today, this hunger is mainly the hidden hunger. When we talk about this, hidden hunger means is the malnutrition. Many times, still issue of the food is there that people don't get food. But more than food, right now, major issue is whether we are giving the food with proper nutrition or not. So some of the factors which define the global crisis is first is undernourishment. When we say that a big share of population that is undernourished, they get insufficient calorie intake. Second major issue becomes child wasting. The situation when we have the child under the age of five, they have low weight as per their average height. If you see there is a BMI, biomass induction, they should be there. And that reflects acute undernutrition. Another issue is child stunting. When child below the age of five years, they have low height for their age. And this again reflects chronic undernutrition. And then another issue is child mortality. Mortality rate of children under the age of five is very high in several developing and underdeveloping countries, especially with the focus if you see Asia and Sub Saharan Africa. So, how we can address these things? When we see, if you see this gap report, 2019 Global Agriculture Productivity Report. If we have to feed the global population by 2015, which is expected to cross 9 billion mark, we need to increase crop production at least at the rate of 1.73%. That is must because we have to almost double the our production, increase the productivity. But current rate is 1.63, which is way less, still less than what we need. But this is average. But if you see the area which is in the sub Saharan Africa and Asia, especially in the countries which are the low income countries group, the growth rate is still around 1%. So if you say there's a huge gap, what is required? So what we need to do, we have to accelerate productivity growth and so that we can achieve global, global nutrition and environment goals. But we should keep in mind, we don't have land to expand for the cultivation. So we have to continue in the same land. We can increase a bit, but majorly we have to focus on increasing the productivity. Some of the technologies which they have, well, came out of these things, how we can address those issues to work. One of the major things came if you see crop genetics. So one of the things by crop genetics, we can address the yield, we can prevent the biohabits, and we can contribute to production increase by increasing the product. Productivity. In addition, there are other factors like soil health, tillage management. This is post-harvest management. 
water and nutrient management, diversification, pest control and pollination, and integrated aquaculture. So these are some of the techniques listed, but here my work, which we work at Equipe, mainly focus, our at least we are, we are working mainly focus on the crop genetics. So I'll be presenting some of the efforts, what we are doing in the crop genetics to address these issues. Before I go into just one slide about our work, the importance of the pulses, if you see, when we are talking about these nutrition security, so pulses are the one which have the potential to contribute to nutrition food security. Green Revolution was able to increase the crop production and were able to feed the large population of the world. But still, there are issues like I showed with child stunting, child wasting, child death, because of they get food but not the proper nutrition diet. So then how we can do, so pulses are the one which has the potential to address those things. How they are suitable for marginal environment. They don't need much of the water. They are high protein and mineral source. They have long shelf life. You can store them, unlike many of the cereals. Then they improve soil condition and they need low water. And among these pulses, if you see chickpea alone is almost 50% of the things. And this is where I most of my talk will be talking about this today on the chickpea. Now coming to think how we have been working on in increasing the genetics of the seed. If you see, in, during few decades, there are a lot of technologies that have been keeping integrated in the plant breeding. And if you see many institutions, they are using some of these technologies, one or two in isolation manner, but there are no focus effort that they should go together. Plant breeders are using one or two maybe in time combination, but there is no proper value chain. And if you see evolvement of this thing, technology started from open pollination and now genomics sometime came back in the last decade, then moved next proteomics. So what next step? So technology is evolving so far. Only thing, how we have to way, find the ways, how we can integrate this technology in crop improvement efforts, how we are working to work on this and how these technology can increase the efficiency of our bidding efforts. So my talk will be majorly two topics. First, the technology advancement, what we have made technology advancement, especially in chickpea, at Ikri said, and then I'll be talking about that, how we are using this technology for contributing chickpea improvement. So my first thing will be sequencing genetic technologies. If you see this slide, and we talk about last two decades, we started sometime in 2000, 2000 when human genome came. It was sequenced on, and that time it took almost a decade to sequence one genome and billions of dollars were spent. So you could see that cost of sequencing was so high and sequencing was so challenging to think about. We were not able to think that, oh, we should plant sequence our crops or things. Then ERA moved in 2007 to 2014. The next general sequencing start to evolve. A lot of technology came like Roche, Illumina, Solid, Helicos, PacBio. And then we started to move from the a genome per decade to genome per year, sometime 2004, 2005, when rice genome came, Shuvo and Niamh maybe away because they worked on chick rice. And then we started that move 2012, 13, that it moved that a genome per day. Sequencing technology evolved so fast. And today, when we are talking about the next generation sequencing at its peak, we are talking about not in one or two, we can sequence more than 100 genomes per day. We have the machine which have the capacity of generating terabytes of data in a day. So then we can generate a lot of knowledge in a day. So this shows the rapid advancement in the technology. But when we talk about the opportunities, in 2000, it was generating about thousands of genes in a year per year kind of thing. When we sequence human genome, we got about few thousand genomes. And then we started to move from 100,000 of genes per year, then millions of genes per year. But today we are talking about tens of millions of genes. It means we got a lot of opportunities to work, but it, we get generated a lot of sequence, but to create to these novel opportunities, we have to identify the novel genes, we have to do the allele discovery, this kind of thing has to be done. So technology is evolving, but we need to learn to make use of the technology. This slide shows, if you see, I slightly modified it, that cost of genome 
per genome, if you see, is going drastically down. In 2005, we are talking about impact. If you go last year or these days, people are talking about that genome in thousand dollars. So people are going, when we are talking about human genome, we seek the billions of dollars, and now we're talking about thousand dollars. So cost has come drastically down. Similarly, the amount of genome sequence can be generated is going up. So this opens the way that now we can think about the sequencing of huge populations in one day, and we can start using these things for the routine bidding program, which doesn't have those much money. Human science has a lot of money because diseases are very important in government. You see that COVID now government are directing every money they have towards the COVID research, but this situation doesn't come any time for the plant science. So when the cost is down, then only we can start thinking about the, bringing the technology the plant science. And among different genotyping technologies, majorly we use two types of technologies, genotyping by sequencing, although there have been patenting issues, so now issues reduce the use of GBS also reduced because of several things. And another approach is SNP arrays. In GBS, what you do is you have those low coverage sequencing based on the multiple digestion, and then you sequence those things, so you get low coverage. But one of the major issues comes that you get GBS is rapid, cost effective, and you get sequencing and genotyping in one step. So these are some, some good things, but when we go about the challenges, you get a lot of missing data and you need huge data and need technical expertise to handle those things. And still, when you are mapping and uh, those things, they're possible to sequence your mapping errors and a lot of missing doesn't allow you to address some of those concerns. So then when we start talking the second technology, then it comes the array-based, which is high density density genotyping and thousands of genotypes uh, now talking about the even more can be genotyped with the same marker every time so using those technologies we start first we developed high density axiom snip array in the chickpea where we have these use sequencing data about four, more than 400 chickpea lines then using different catalyzed SNPs, there should not be no SNP on 30 flanking base pair and then no repeated sequence. You mean, you mean the different criteria, we selected a set of more than 70,000 SNPs and based on different scores by the company and then we made a final available the SNP array of more than 50,000 SNPs which was available. And if you see this screen, it shows that the overall genome distribution of those SNPs. So you have the SNP from the entire genome. There's not even a single gap. So you got SNPs. So this is a good resource when, if you have to do some high resolution mapping because more than 50,000, but for every application, when you talk about the 50,000 SNPs, so it comes at a cost. So you have to see there's a cost, how much cost you want to put, how much these things. So we cannot use everywhere this kind of, this is good for the high resolution mapping kind of thing. But there are application where you don't need 50,000, you just need 2,000, 3,000, or 5,000 SNPs. For that purpose, we started to work with Thermos, and we started to target a, a mid-density mid NGIS platform, where which is just a targeted GBS, a flexible, powerful, accurate genotyping system. So this genotype, based on the sequencing, what so what it does, it you select some of the target, you sequence those target and do, does the allele calling. And then, because you uh, do the sequencing, so there's a possibility of getting the, some novel alleles in addition to the known SNPs. So if I'm starting with 5,000, so minimum marker data, I'll get 5,000, but there are possibility, I may get few additional SNPs based on the sequencing data. So in the chickpea, we developed those mid-density arrays where we have developed the 5,000 markers and we have kept those priority one and priority two markers. And now these, SNP arrays are ready and available for genotyping. Like I mentioned, there's a high density genotyping, there's a mid density, and then next, what about the low density kind of thing? So we at XS started work on the chickpea QC panel. We use the sequencing data on chickpea parental lines, identify about a set of 48 markers. We validated those markers on the selected parental lines. And finally, we came up with the 14 markers and we did validation, and this panel is also available for genotyping. When we talk about these different kind of markers thing, 
I think only Rice has so far, which has a defined QC panel, and which is very much useful for this kind of technologies. And another thing, when we have this technology, another major challenge comes, how we can make them cost effective. So I think you said Dr. Rajiv Vashnet together with ARI, CIMATE, and several other CGI center through a gates funded project, they initiated, started a project called STPG, where plan was to sequence, provide genotyping services at very cheap cost. So the, we entered in a collaborative agreement with Intertech, one of the service provider. And based on this part of this project, genotyping services to national partner and CGI system is, was being provided at the cost of $1.5 per sample for genotyping of 10 SNP marker, including DNA isolation. This was one of the very cost effective marker system. And when we talk about these things, sorry, for, like Shuvo mentioned that, that I have been working on the forward bidding thing. So idea is that you get when you are dealing with the F2 lines, use a screen with those STPG marker, you select for positive values, and then you keep on addressing, then you select with the disease or your quality trait. In the end, you keep on reducing the number of lines based on marker, and this gives you possibility to select the lines with all the possible traits you want to have. There is always a challenge and question when we talk about the markers. People get confused that, oh, you talk that you have so many markers, so all these millions of markers should be useful for proper improvement. No. There are different types of technology, so I just thought to clarify before we move ahead. When we talk about markers, there may be millions of the markers. Like when we do the sequencing in chickpea, we got four to five million of markers. But being marker is one thing. First step should be the whether they are polymorphic in that population I want to use. This reduce number of the markers drastically. Then how many of these can be mapped? Maybe this will further reduce. And then markers associated with my trait of interest. And at the end, if I want to have a diagnostic marker, which gives me presence or absence, if this marker is there. So you will start from millions, but at the end, reach one, two, or five, or 10 markers, not more than that, that may be directly deployed in the breeding program. So in summary, we got all the possible, I did not discuss about SR and DART, because these are the very old thing, at least at that we don't use. Still, some people in chickpea also using, and if somebody has question, they can come to us, we can provide support for this thing. But right now, our major focus is on GBS, 50 SNP array, whole genome sequencing, mid density arrays, or the this low density SNP panel. Once we got these different technologies, the question comes, which one we should be using, how we should be, how we should make selection, oh, this technology I should be using or another technology I should be using. So for this, if you see fixed arrays, Illumina, Infimine, and then Affimatrix. We in Chickpea have the Affimatrix, so this provides 50 case snips. They can be genotyped three to four samples or maybe more in a round. So if you are somewhere around, you want to genotype with high number of SNPs, and the limited number of samples, you can go ahead with the affimatic SNP or the Illumina SNP. But SNPs are more here, but number of samples are limited. But if you have one number of SNPs are less and you want to do several thousands of the samples or the more number of samples, then you can choose the flexible PCR based SNPs, Douglas array tape or fluid anything. The number of SNPs reduce, but number of samples becomes huge here. And then GBS, restriction and based GBS, it gives a 10 to 100,000 SNPs in the sample of 96 to 304,000. Amplicon sequence, this is a variable number, 20 to 500 SNPs and 40 to 300 samples. So this is kind of, these days if you go, everybody goes to superstore. So you, you have everything is, is available in the shop. You go choose as per whatever you feel like. You want low, low density panel, that thing we will have. You don't mid density, we have, you want, High density, we can provide that kind of thing. And then in addition to this, we also develop the whole genome sequence kind of thing. So now we have a lot of flexibility and a lot of low cost genetic options. Only thing you have to make best decision, wise decision, which technology you want to do, which cost you can afford, what is your application. Now coming to my second part where we started to use the genomics tools for chip improvement. In 2016, we reviewed one article, did a review for the Frontiers Plant Science, where we 
so like this how modern breeding approaches can enhance the rate of genetic gain so this starts somewhere from the germ plug and genetic resources where we have material from gene bank we use some of the diverse materials for developing the real population mutants ubiquitous population the reference set nam population magic population core collection in addition for the new approach genomic selection we can develop a training population based on elite lines and then we do the this precise phenotyping use semi automatic or automatic phenotyping platforms we do the genotyping or sequencing of those populations we then we undertake the trait mapping using different approaches like among functional genomics epigenomics transcriptomics metabolomics proteomics these are functional genomics approaches or the genomic approach you can use the gvas biparental mapping composite interval mapping and sequence based mapping and when we are talking about the training population we are doing the genome wide prediction based on the genome wide markers and at the end of the day we get markers with the trait of interest or the gbv genome wide breeding values and then we use those things using the modern genomics tool like genomic selection marker selection mbc mark and ultimately we result in the genomic wide breeding input lines which are ready for testing in the farmer field trials and ultimately release coming to chickpea the crop i work all the most of you may be aware what is chickpea and how is it but still i saw several students are there so i thought to just give them if you see chickpea is one of the excellent source of high quality protein high quality means there are several if you several crops which are high protein but chickpea protein is high quality because it's a good digestibility which determines the bioavailability presence of nutrition in the seed is one thing but presence of that nutrition for a body is another thing so if it is bioavailability is good that is very good quality protein and it has the large amount of fixed large amount of atmospheric nitrogen so chickpea is second most important grain legume cultivated globally which over 70 producing over 17 million tons in the last year if you see chickpea global production has been constantly increasing in the last five decades and there are two type of chickpeas desi and kabuli one of the major thing despite being the largest producer india's largest importer as well why because chickpea is one of the major food source for the what we say the vegetarian diet and it's a very good nutrition source and despite sustainable growth chickpea production last decade in india there is a huge gap in supply demand due to limited supply so despite as i mentioned it's still it's the largest importer producer chick india is also largest importer so we need to develop and adopt improved varieties with higher yield and nutrition to reduce this yield gap so that india can become the self sufficient and contribute to the export also but what are the factors affect the chickpea productivity if you see chickpea has a potential to address nutrition security to address the micronutrient deficiency but several limitations like stress tolerance drought heat salinity among abiotic and biotic if you see escovita blight seasonal wilt health cover is a major thing and then there are other things but how we can start doing this we can start doing the genetic analysis and we can understand the linkage mapping and cutaneous we can identify candidate genes the super haplotypes then we can develop the diagnostic markers and start using those markers in the marker seed selection backcrossing make allergen screening and using genomic selection we can accelerate the chickpea improvement effort this is something which we have been doing it and how we started it at ecris that you might have seen that program where i work is name is research program genetic gain so our major focus is to enhance the rate of genetic gain for the our crops i work on chickpea so my agenda is to work and accelerate enhance the rate of genetic for chickpea improvement how we can do it we for doing this we need genomic resources we need precise phenotyping in the end we need breeding sub breeder friendly genetic support tools because once you have genomic resource you not know, data you need these tools to make a wise decision if you don't have those decisions tools wisely you may end up making wrong decision and this will mess up everything using these three technology we start to deploy a modern breeding approaches and what are the modern breeding approaches we are using we are using market stream backcrossing genomic selection and other thing and contributing to increase the genetic gains like we were discussing when we started this thing that chickpea if you see 10 years back chickpea was a crop which did not have many genomic resources we have only couple of hundred as far 
not many SNPs, those things were not available at all. Scenario changed at when in 2013, chickpea genome became available. At Ikisat, Dr. Ajiv Vaishnet, together with the Global Consortium, International Chickpea Consortium, we sequenced the chickpea draft genome in 2013, and we changed the direction of chickpeas improvement, chickpea genomic research. If you see, although we sequence one genome, but is it enough? Maybe not. If you see the, I mean, gene bank has a lot of diversity. So if to capture entire diversity, we have one sequencing will not be enough. When we talk about a chickpea at Ikrizat, we have more than 20,000 expressions. And then different kind of uh, collections are there, like composite collection of 3,000, core collection of 900, equivalent reference of 300, the wild species extraction, breeding line, a lot of things are available. So do you think sequencing one genome will be enough? No. So we need to start. And then we started sequencing of different germ plus lines. We initiated with sequencing of parental lines. These are the, we sequenced 35 parental lines, which are the parents of different mapping population we were using for trait mapping. And based on those certified parental lines, we developed about more than about 200 gigabyte data for 35 genotypes, which was an average 10x coverage. And it identified more than 2 million SNPs and about 292,000 indels. And these, if you see the, the line specific in insertion and deletion SNPs were identified. And these SNPs can now be deployed for the, when we're talking about these parental lines for the making cross making the line improvement. So this resource is helpful for the breeding point of view. Another effort we did that we sequenced more than 100 chickpea varieties. This was released in India and globally. Idea was whether there was one of the challenge every time comes that people talk about, oh, there's a lot of diversity, no diversity. So we wanted to check when we identified that recent breeding programs and hence the genetic diversity in Desi and Kabuli. We identified 1.3 million SNPs across those 129 varieties, and we did a lot of analysis about those, how it has evolved, how we have been working those things. And recently, last year, we completed sequencing of more than 400 chickpea lines. The paper came in Nature Native last year, and where we sequenced 300 lines from chickpea reference set, including 100 varieties and other lines, we identified about 4.9 million SNPs. We identified about more than 100 candidate domestic regions, which were affected during the domestication of chickpea. They were affected when chickpea was evolving. And we identified some of the sweep analysis, basal sweep analysis, even diversity from wild to lendesis for the breeding line. So these are some of the analysis which we did based on the resequence data last year. Then based on this thing, one of us, sometime in 20, 14, 15, we initiated a large initiative. People have heard about the 3000 rice initiative. So we also initiated in the chickpea, 3000 chickpea genome initiative, where we sequenced more than 3,356 samples. Total about 30 terabyte data was generated and 4 million SNPs identified. One thing which was new, which was not part of the rice, together with general sequencing data of those 3000 lines, we, together with national system in India, like IAPR, Junagar, J Agricultural University, RK, RK College, Sihor, and several other institutes, we and Jaipur, at six locations, we phenotyped these 3,000 lines, which was a difficult task. When we start think it was a challenge and everybody's question, it's not possible. We took it as a challenge and we phenotyped all these 3,000 lines at six locations in India for two seasons. And we recorded data on these traits like agronomy yield rate data. In addition, we generate some data on the nutrition traits also. There are some of the snapshots from the field because every time the people think, no, it's not possible. It was difficult, it was challenging, but we were able to manage. And this was one thing which gives a very good data and where we stand ourselves that, okay, yes, we are doing something, really something different than others were doing in addition to sequence. Apart from these things, we had like I showed different kind of arrays. So we did a lot of trait mapping, horizontal trait mapping, where we mapped different traits, droughts, salinity, seed size, health corpus response. Some of these were published, some of these are under reviews. And these steps, 
now we are at a stage of where we got the marker and now next step is the validation and then deployment in the breeding program apart from the salinity seed cell and all those things as i mentioned one of the major focus was nutrition in chickpeas although it's high rich but we there is a lot of diversity available in chickpeas so we have possibility to increase that nutrition further in chickpeas so we started with the jiva and we were able to map some of the traits like beta carotene iron phytic acid beta, vitamin zinc and we identified some of the candidate genes for those things which we started to use for further validation i told so far about the genomics effort we were doing in addition of another thing i was the precise phenotyping so we at equiset together with physiologist dr yana kolava we and chickpea breeding team dr puram gore and dr shrinivasan we work on together with them and start evaluating it we mainly use four different platforms legis scan renout shelter glasshouse and field based phenotyping legis scan is mainly used for fine scaling of canopy development and architecture of plants at the estate state to understand the physiological aspects and then we use the renout shelter for assessment of the plant water use over the entire crop cycle together with relevant agronomic data glass house we use for the control condition where we have to give the stress for estimation of plant water use under control condition in combination with agronomic and yield data field based evaluation method is used for the agronomic and yield assessment of the progeny performance as i mentioned profile so we took one small project on the integration lines that was developed together with dr bhardwa and i think we screen them on the legis scan we phenotypes are like project leaf area tree leaf area specific leaf weight so that those states and we enter chickpea dot all as lines and these things we screen for canopy traits some of those lines for we screen the glass house for dot tolerance and physical parameters the picture is rupik he is a student of dr rajiv he is a phd student he does a lot of work on those evaluation and take care of those experiment based on these things last year dr bhardwaj made a release of first ever molecular biology varieties in chickpea in india although if you see among chickpea australia and canada are one of the developed country who do lot of research in chickpea but india became first country together with ethiopia where the drought tolerant variety was released last year it is the name of bgm 10216 it gives 12% higher yield compared to the recent parent dr bhardwaj from icri who also gave a talk in biogenesis platform he highlighted this thing and this was one of the efforts which paved the way for the new way of research kind of thing and based on this if you see several lines are in the pipeline which will be released this year or the coming year and this opens the way for the marker should be crossing a molecular breeding in chickpea and show that what we are doing in the lab doesn't we only publish and finish it we take it to make a story so we believe in starting from basic research making applied aspect and delivering the product this is the entire pipeline now coming to the area which is of my prime importance these days optimization of genomic prediction based selection strategy how we have been doing if you see that how people say that we should start using markers for the crop improvement but there is always a challenge how we should use so if you see almost 12 years back tex bernardo one of the lead breeder and i always follow his papers and got an opportunity to meet him once and i discussed so he reviewed this long back 12 years back that we should know why we want to find details how we why we want to use them in the selection details how if you see there is a clear cut thing when we are talking about the few of size one or two we can introduce major qtl we can do digin dusky we can make selection of things so these are the approach clone qtl competitive mechanism mapping we can use but when we are talking number of things increasing we have to combine this qtls using f2 enrichment using mass approach but if we have number of many qtls we want to control many qtls and we want to make selection using elite lines so gs is on the approach which is very useful so ultimately we need to consider gain per unit time and cost rather than gain per cycle so use of markers is not straight we have to see the gain what gain we are making how we are contributing to it so if you see a normal breeding cycle it starts with the crossing then inbreeding seed increase multi lotion multi year testing 
and ultimately to field phenotyping and we contribute to line selection so entire this is a huge six to eight years process and it takes for a line development how we can control it or how it contribute sorry if you see the video situation where genetic gain over time is directly proportional to the selection intensity is how many lines lines to select selection accuracy how accurately you are selecting the lines available genetic variance among the parental lines and inversely proportional to the years per cycle so how many selection you can make in a year so if we have to increase the genetic gain and hence the rate of genetic gain we have to address all those four points and how we can address those four points increase variation so how ultimately we can increase the variation so one or two options will be that we start making wild crosses we start opening mutations but to make wild crosses you need to have the be those background information on those parental lines so they, this is where genomic information can be helpful if we genotype and develop a database of the parental lines we can select those parental lines based on the marker information they are distinctly related and we can start using them in the crossing increase precision how to increase the precision test more plots per line in theory it looks good oh test more plots per line but when we think about the cost testing more lines per plot is not an easy job it comes with a cost and how to address those cost point of things but if we can include the genomics your genomics not that expensive as a field is not even we can increase the precision in the line selection select harder test more lines again field pin up tipping up more lines is always comes with the cost but genomic selection is always reduce the cost and enable the thing reduce time out of season nurseries how to reduce the times you have to make two three generation a year or you have to take the out of season nurseries how to do for this another many people must have heard recently the speed bidding approach from dr lee hickey at it said dr shrinivasan and dr gore they have also been working on the chickpe so they have developed the rga or speed breeding protocol which can take using this it can take up to 6 to 7 generation per year in that greenhouse so if you can do such kind of thing this can directly contribute to the increase rate of genetic gains so this was recently published in the crop journal where they have selected this how they can take up to the 22 days they are the at different stages they select the seed and they were trying to see whether they germinate and ultimately they were able to end that they can six to say seven generation in a year which increase the tremendous seed and even two years of the time you will have your population ready for the field evaluation which earlier used to take six to seven years so this reduce the time of line improvement drastically in addition to this another approach which address all those points is the genomic selection the concept of genomic selection was sometime given in 2001 by mewison their paper was came in the genetics what is genomic selection genomic selection is nothing is a form of marker stress selection that simultaneously estimate all local haplotypes and marker effects across the entire genome to calculate genomic breeding values concept was started for cattle now for last few years we'll start to use the crop improvement but initially it the came what they used to do they used to make a reference of training population that they have the lot of phenotyping data available and the thousands of seed data available they estimate the correlation between the phenotyping and this the factor and the prediction equation and then as soon as the new material came they genotype with those markers and using the prediction equation they estimate the gbb they estimate the value of this progeny without waiting for the time so when we are talking the cattle this is the thing but how it helps in the breeding, plant breeding we make crosses we make crosses on the parents suppose our parents are somewhere here and the new population comes so to estimate the value of these things we have to take this progeny to the field but taking the field takes time it takes cost if we genotype those that progeny with these things we can predict the performance so this is how genome selection helps how it helps maybe i just say nuts and bolts so there are two way approach one is the model training cycle where we have those training population elite lines informative for the model improvement we genotype those lines if they have already been phenotype data available if not we phenotype all these lines and we have genotype and phenotyping data 
we train those prediction or genomic selection prediction model. When the model is established, a new germplasm comes. We genotype that line. We put that line to the genomic selection model. We select the lines with based on highest GBVs, make crosses and advanced generation. This is a line development cycle. And some of the lines with higher GBVs, they can that is released and become part of training population. So here we have two set of population, training population, another is breeding population or research testing population. And here is the line development cycle and is the population improvement cycle, which is a two-step strategy. Like I just showed how about this bidding scheme in the previous slide. This is a simple thing, but how we can make it an improvement. If we can somehow skip this inbreeding, seed increase, multi location testing, and this, if we start after making cross, if we start deploying the genomic selection, we can reduce this multi year testing, multi year location testing to some extent, and therefore reduce the selection cycle and time in the thing, and they may contribute to the you can like you can screen more number of lines. Maybe coming here, I just coming to each point like selection intensity. As I mentioned, genotyping is cheaper than the phenotyping. So instead of taking many lines to the field, we can genotype those larger population in the same cost, and this will increase the selection intensity. Selection accuracy when we got marker linked to the trait, there definitely you can make the off-target year, so you can select based on precisely. Using those marker base, we can maintain the favorable release. It will contribute to maintain genetic variance. And like I mentioned, if you make the selection using this marker base, we can reduce those multi-year testing kind of thing, and we can make selection earlier on the basis line, single prime base, and ultimately contributing to the increase in genetic gain rate. Coming to the chickpea story of genomic selection, so together with Dr. Gore, we defined a set of 320 lines, elite lines, as a training population sometime eight years almost now back. We we had some data on those things, but that data was scattered. So we, together with Dr. Bardo at IRI, we screened these lines at th for three seasons at Eclipset and IRI New Delhi for descriptive and yield related traits under rainfall and irrigated conditions. All these lines were phenotyped at three replication in alphabetic design at Eclipset and IRI. And then we genotype. I'm talking about the 2011 and 12. That time, genome sequence was not available. So we were using DART that time. So we got marker data about DART on 3,000 marker data. Later, after genome sequence came, we genotyped these lines with the GenoBS. We got marker about 88,000 markers. And recently, we genotyped this population with the exome, cypher SNP arrays, the 50K. And we got about 24K polymorphic markers. And then we started to use these markers using different this is summarize of how we have been using the training population. Two locations, three season phenotyping data. We use DART, seq GBS, SNP thing. Once we have the phenotyping and genotyping data, we are using genomic selection analysis. And how we are using, I'll just explain the next slide. Earlier, when we are using the DART data, we took Dr. Bhar, Dr. Rathor, Abhishek Rathor from Equiset. He is leading this SPDM, Statistical Biometric Data Management Group. We start to work on those data. We use six GS models, the reservation R bluff model, kinship based regression, then several Bayesian model, and then machine learning based random forest model. And that time we target yield rate, seed yield, 100 seed weight, base to flow coming and base to maturity. And then based on this, we made pixel models and we published this thing sometime in 2016. But then we start to think that how we can use, the, because when we talk about the IRI and the potential, there are a lot of G by E. So we start that can we have the G by E infection on those things? Then we start to talk with Dr. Krosa from CIMIT. So then we use this data, two locations, three is a nine environment data, and we added, made some new traits, like average plant diet biomass in addition to the yield, the regular traits. We use new different models which has the main effect to environment and the main effect to the line L and the main effect to the DART marker as well as GBS marker. So there are three different interactions of the models. And then we had the six models where we were having the different direction, the L into E environment interaction. We use three cross-validation schemes, CV1, when a set of lines has not been evaluated in any of the environment. Means randomly we divide lines and we make that no data is available at all for that line. 
CB2 when some site of lines have been evaluated, some environments, but not on others. Can we estimate those things? CB0 and an observed environment using the remaining environment as training site. So how we were able to do it? And in CB2, prediction performance was very much correlated the release lines and correlated environment is used and prediction was very much useful. And this thing was published 2018 in the scientific reports. After publication of these two papers, we thought, okay, we have done a lot of customization on those genomic selection tools. Can we use these tools in the routine breeding program for making selection? Then I also worked with the Gobi, one of the collaboration, I'll tell about this later. So we, together with Dr. Aya Bhardwaj from IRI, Gobi, and Cornell University, we started to have a practical implement approach where we selected F2 plant from the EQZ bidding program, F5 plant from EQZ bidding program, as well as IRI bidding program. So in all, we selected 6,000 F5 plants, 3,000 from IRI, 3,000 from EQZ. We did genotyping of those 6,000 lines. And based on the 320 lines, we select, made a selection and have to compare this, we made two sets of the lines. One set where the breeder made selection based on the visual performance, another set was made based on these GBVs. And during the previous year crop season, all these two sets went to the field for the competitive field evaluation. And Dr. Bhardwa at IRI, he made wonderful work there and we were able to find that, yes, it's working very fine. Maybe I come in the thing. So what we did for the analysis we used, we use about total 315 population in the training population, about 5,000 F5 plants genotyped using LDDART. Markers, because when we genotype, L, there are two different methods than we use genotype, because when we talk about the 5,000 plants, I cannot genotype them with the high density or those high cost genotyping systems. So then we start to talk with the DART. They come up with a new technique called LDDART, so low density DART. But we got challenged because markers were different. So we started to find marker based on sequence similarities. So we find about 900 markers which are common. And then we started to use merge by sequence and start to do those things. If you see this image, this shows the similarity of those 5,000 lines with the training population. This is the training population screen and these are the different lines among those things. So these lines, some of those lines are closely related to these training population, some are not closely related. So this showed, give us a lot of understanding of how GS should work in the regular breeding program. And when we were doing the prediction accuracy, we got very good prediction accuracy for yield rate, like 100 seed weight. But seed yield also was a good prediction of about 2.2. Many people say oh, 0.2 was very less, but when it took out genomic selection, 0.2 is not considered bad. It's an optimum and we got good prediction accuracy, although there are some challenges. So we started to work with Dr. Bhardwaj and then AICRP system in India to address some of those challenges. And now we are together with them are deploying this breeding program in the regular breeding program, this genomic selection. Apart from this, then we started to work on the, how this relationship metrics work. So we had some of the data we were having, we started to use for deployment, how this different relationship metrics work. So for this, what we did, we use this training population 320 as a cross correlation of the training population, equivalent IRA material. And then for the testing set, we use those 5,000 one and two genotypes from the set and magic population from set. We use this as a testing set and we started to understand the influence of market density, population structure, and the relationship on the peculiarity of GS. So this was a separate experiment to test the hypothesis. If you see this PC results, it summarizes that PC component one and two explains almost 80% of the variance among those populations. And this showed that 100 seed contributed at least by variance component. We started to analyze those things. So this is the heat map. This shows that we identify a common set of markers between training population as well as testing population. Those 5,000 markers as well as 320 lines and the magic population. We identify about 28,000 common markers which are common within training population and the testing population. This is a distribution on the genome. We test those cross validation scheme, as I mentioned, within site CV1, we across site CV2. As I mentioned in the previous slide, we use six different models, E plus L, main effect to environment and line, E plus G, main effect to environment and marker information, E plus L plus G, main effect to all three major factors, environment, line, and marker information. 
then we use the interaction of environment to line interaction environment to market interaction environment to line into environment to market interaction all that together we use and we got these kind of prediction accuracy. If you see when we are including the line environment and all the interaction, we were getting very good prediction compared to only line environment. And this, we started to check for this. And if you see average prediction accuracy were different for DTF and run rate and for PHSCY, especially for the models compared to G by E. So this is very good that G by E inclusion models are very good. Complex state like seed yield, it has lower prediction accuracy compared to to forwarding and plant type, just simple trait. And here, if you see the patient for different trait, and they were very showing the optimism that yes, we can test those things. And when we start to check those things, if you see the model, models based on the interaction of EL and E by G were given the very optimum prediction accuracies, and we started to use these models for the further testing of our genomic selection model. This is genetic diversity for, based on the training population profile. And if you see more than 6,000 genotypes were used for injury tree, including 5,000 FI lines, about 1,200 magic lines, and 300 training population. This clear cut shows that there is a training population is blue in indicators here. And these are the FI progeny, which are mainly desi, and these are the magic lines. They made clip, clear cut difference in the based on these markers. Some of these markers are correct, and they were able to segregate those things. Then we started to use it deployment strategy. So what we did, we selected those 320 as a training set. We used two set of market data. One was 20, 28,000 common SNPs. Another set was 15,000 selected based on the GVAS. We did GVAS from these markers and selected markers, which were found as stated. Test set was used about the 6,000 lines are used as a test set. And then predict G, G, F5 lozenges for the prediction use and prediction of magic. We have made separate prediction in the first strategy we use all the common markers that is a 28,000 and second study we use subset about 15,000 markers based on the GVAS and we compare the result of two strategies to train the model and if you see we got this mean prediction accuracies which were for the day's flowering range from 0.4 to 0.5 and for plant height it ranged from the 0.3 to 0.38 similarly for seed yield was the range of 0.2 so based on our these competitions, we find that initial results from Pfizer says that GS has definitely a role in accelerating the chick improvement effort. For prediction accuracy, like seed yield was lower compared to the base to point plant type. As I mentioned previously, there are some challenges about the relationship. So we started work with Dr. Bhardwaj and all in that chick peak program. We added some additional 500 lines from national breeding programs as training population. This year, the training portion evaluated at different NAC location for yield and quality trait. And we are expanding the diversity by including the, to increase the genetic gains using genomic selection. So this is about genomic selection and this comes the last point of the distance support tools as I mentioned. I mentioned briefly about the GOBI. This is Genomic Open Breeding Informatic Initiative. It's a global community and a gates funded project, which was led by Cornell University and three CG centers, Equiset, together with Irri and Simit. Gobi focused on five crops, chickpea and sorghum from Equiset, rice from Irri, and wheat and maize from Simit. Apart from this, some of the partner centers were DART, the James Sutton Institute UK, and BTI in the corner. So mission of this thing was to develop a stable, high quality, easy to deploy genomic data management. and develop these decision support tools and release to the breeders and improve data availability so that breeding management can system can make this. Gobi to, working together with different partners developed very four tools, GDM, Gobi genomic data management, Gobi DART tools for making selection, quality control selection, Gobi genomic selection pipeline, GS Galaxy, that is used for the genomic selection these days. Gobi GHI tools for the MABC module for market backcrossing and F1 pedigree verification module for making the hybrid testing in those things. Just a brief about the Galaxy pipeline. Gobi together with EIB developed a customized the existing GS pipeline where you have all the models that you can take with the blue, blue calculator and code V2 genotypes. This thing you can impute your genotyping data and you can do the GBS prediction, you can do cross validation. For this, what you have to do, you just upload a genotyping file, you upload a map file, you upload a genotype file, 
if you don't have map file it's fine for genomic selection mainly you need genotype and phenotype file once you upload those things data you just execute and what is the steps if you see go data extract post to galaxy and then data get data upload from this to browser to the server and then it runs visual calculator for, for calculating genomic predictions and then visualize the tool and you can save the workflow and go back later in addition gobi also provide integration with the different systems like bms etc for the weeding management system gobi as i mentioned initially for the genomic support so gobi has integrated itself with the B gobi bms stpg so that market data come back from the vendor come back to the gobi and using those as support tools and using bms phenotyping data they better is able to make decisions so overall idea was that contribute gobi is to address the concerns provide solution to the bidder they should not be handling the excel files and from equity set major focus of chickpea and sorghum but now for new crops other mandated crops like groundnut pigeon pea palmetto and spinach are also being added so these are some of the resources that equity set is putting for the gobi in the end agenda was that translating genomics information crop so a lot of genomic resources and cost genomic platforms are made available with precise phenotyping and then user friendly pipelines that is support tools developed and these are being deployed using different tools mass you know selection for the increase in the bidding program in the end just i would like to suggest that now instead of this earlier thing this is the one of the came from the last this year the view we made it that now it's time that we should start talking about the sequencing based holistic bidding approach instead of the regular bidding program so what we need to do that we need to start using those omics genetic source populations and the gvas identify the superior alleles based on the sequencing phenotyping data and those things and then start using them in the bidding population based on sequencing phenotyping this information helps in the parent selection we make the f1 we do the allele screening and once we reach this f6 this like lines with the high gbvs and we start the tri yield trials and double the input lines now future will be a integrated toolbox not the isolated one if we have to make a good program which focus on the bms gobi genomic resources and genetic resources and then these are used together with agronomic practices to do the improved varieties i would like to end with the quote from norman warlock food is the moral right of all who are born into the world but that in that scenario food was going to be the food but to this i would add that now we should not talk about only food we should be talking about the food with nutrition so we should be working provide to the food another thing people say that everything can wait but not food so we need to give due credit to the food and thanks to the all the colleagues at cg special thanks to dr rajiv vashne for giving the opportunity to work here and contribute to chickpea and donors billion billion gate foundation government of india icr gobi and equiset thank you thank you sir uh, now we we have collected few few questions uh, i we think that these are the relevant to your talk particularly because there are a lot of question are the basics like full form of qtl and this all so we are not taking that that uh, basic question uh, so this just one sir i i just So I paste it one by one in the chat box, Zoom chat box. Let me check. I need to change the square view. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is there any work going on to increase beta carotene level in chickpea compared to golden rice to at this certain store in India? So first, maybe I'll start with this beta carotene thing. As I may, is it fine? Yes, sir. No problem. No yeah. problem. as i mentioned in fact if you see there are not many reports available these are initial insights and some of the things which i also came to know recently but right now we need to assess the very first available diversity what available in chickpea to increase the first so there is a need to have the focus efforts what kind of diversity for beta carotene available in chickpea in general it was higher to golden rice one but yes current status general status is not higher than golden rice 2 which increased 23 fold of the golden rice 
So this is in, in preliminary stage. We are just checking. And once the, we had our gen diversity, and it's not a kind of competition that we have to beat golden rice. No. We have to see first of all diversity and then see what is scope we can do. Second, is it effective to how to use load as a sequencing genetic gene feeding program? Is it enough to make about the low density sequencing, yes, but there is a clicker strategy you have to follow. You cannot straight away use it because I skipped one of the slide in event of time. When to use a low density? Suppose I need to use low density in the population. So general strategy, what people are doing these days, that all the parental lines has to be sequenced on high coverage, 15 to 20x minimum. And if you have high coverage data available for those parental lines, then progeny is using low coverage, you can predict using imputation and different algorithms. So those are possible loaders. But in addition, if you're talking about the genomic selection using 5,000 kind of marker. So earlier people used to talk about, oh, for genome selection, I need millions of marker or 80,000, 100,000 markers. But based on our experiment, based on different groups, in, who are working on those things, they suggest that there is no need of these many markers. If I say chickpea, I don't need more than 2,000 markers to run the chickpea genomic selection algorithm. So that's the reason we thought to develop about 5,000 in any population, we'll get about two to 3,000 polymorphic markers, and they will be ideal for us to run a genomic selection program using those 5,000 markers. Question three, why genomic selection is most promising for genomic, genetic improvement? It's not that it's considered most effect promising, but as I showed you, the, if you see the breeding equation, there are four parameters. Genomic selection in one go, if you do it properly, you get optimize your breeding model. So they address several of those factors because it's always expensive to take few thousand lines to, to the field. You cannot think about taking 5,000 lines or 10,000 lines of field because that adds a lot of cost. In national system, we don't care about the field cost. In CG center or other center, if you see the private industries, they calculate each and every cost, lab, labor cost, field cost, and everything. Even in the national system, you don't pay for the field charge, but a lot of management goes. Skinning 10,000 lines is always challenging. The recording of data, when 10,000 lines are in the field, you cannot estimate 10,000 line data, days to flow, even for the simple days to flowering. It will not be easy for, this will be a lot of work and the possibility of error. But if you can do that thing based on marker, this will definitely help. And so that's why gene selection has the potential for improving. But there is one caveat. To deploy high quality genomic selection or most effective, first thing is you have to have the precise phenotyping data. If you don't have phenotyping data, good phenotyping data, you cannot have a good genomic selection model. So this is correlated thing. So, and nowhere I'm push suggesting that when we have genomic selection, we don't need to do phenotyping. We have to do phenotyping and phenotyping is key for running a genomic selection program. How can we assemble various scaffolds of sequencing? How can we remove repeated SNPs in each scaffold? So this will be technical. If you want me to address or I can address this thing in the email. How can we make it? In the short period, can we make trait mapping with the comprehensive samples? For this, if you see 2019, there's a paper from Dr. Ajay Vashne, Vashne et al., the sequencing-based trait mapping. Now there's an approach, you can start using the bulk segregate analysis. You don't need to do the phenotyping of those things. If you have the phenotyping data, you just can select the extreme bulk for traits. Suppose you have disease resistant mapping population. You can select the trait which are completely resistant lines from 10 lines from the resistant, 10 lines from susceptible. You can bulk select sequence those two bulk to the parent and using those BSA approach you can do the trait mapping in a very short period. You don't need to genotype entire population. You don't need to do phenotyping also. If you have to improve the yield, what is the correlation between protein content and yield? The correlation between protein content and yield, there are reports that they are negatively correlated, and that's where genomics comes in picture. If we can identify that linkages, 
and genomics can because when we are talking the high resolution mapping, high resolution because genomics gives you information on the each base. This will definitely help to break that linkage, and we will able to break that thing. But thing is, this is theoretical. We need to work on this, and we started to work in this direction. But right now, I'll not say we have done it. This is something ideas need to do, and we are working on this direction. What was age of chickpea plant used for DNA extraction for genotyping? Generally, we take two weeks fresh leaves, but when when it is early, we can do just seedling from the even one week plant, depending on the research. Yes, on land receive. Genomic selection is not for the land races. Genomic selection, if you see genomic selection, there are two straight strategies. One is the population improvement. What is the product time consuming? In fact, I'll say it's time saving because if you do sequencing, you have to do a lot of sequencing analysis. You have to clean the data, you have to do those things. But it's step area, once the data is there, you have to put this in the tool and you'll get the allele matrix. So this is not time consuming. But target front has lost any essential characters. We want to recover this technology and less costly. There are different biometrics tools, so for different things and depending on the sequencing data, there are different tools. For GWAS data, we normally use command line. We use GAPIT or the Tesla, but there's command line. But depend on the data, so it will be difficult to recommend which tool right now and which tool not. It will be challenging because this will be a lot of depend on the data quality, data coverage, and all those things. How can you which type of markers to be used? As one of the slides when I was talking about the markers depend on the application. First, I'll many people labs are still using SRs instead of I'm, although I said that we use the same marker, but many people because these needs a lot of capital. But right now, these are days you don't need to create instruction in your lab. You can easily outsource those things. Some of those technologies, in fact, at Equiset, we have CGSP, which is had headed by Ms. Anu Chetiknani here. If you need some of the genotyping services, you can contact her, you can write an email to her and she will be able to provide. So markers depend on the application and cost. But how much cost you want to do was, you know, that's all from my side. If I miss something, so you can tell me, Nia. Yeah. No, sir, it's question. fine, it's fine. You, you answer a lot of, lot of questions. Uh, Thank you. So sir, uh, now we move to, uh, our next session that is a interview it is it is like a motivational talk uh, from you and your journey because there is a lot of youngsters a lot of UG and uh, pg students are there uh, so please uh, i hand it over to shoma for your interview shoma hello um, we are now moving ahead to the interview section of today's webinar Today is our 16th webinar of the series, and we are honored to have with us Dr. Manish Rurkiwal. Hello, sir. Uh, it's wonderful to have you with us today. Um, uh, sir, uh, you are a very successful plant scientist, and we would love to know how you started your career. Uh, could you please tell us about your journey so far as a plant scientist? Thank you so much. And uh, successful, I don't know, but yes, I've been trying to do my bit. One thing I must say that, in fact, uh, when I was a kid, I used to talk to my mom and every time I was friend that, oh, I, when are they, this is a common question in India. You must also say, oh, why, what do you want to do? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, we, when we ask our kids, I know what do you want to do. Mm -hmm. so I always have this thing that I want to do something which contribute to the human mankind. Because whenever I used to see many times I feel that there's a lot to do in the society. And always feel that I'm, there's somewhere if I can contribute to the nation building and something like that. And then in the masters, when I was doing my masters, mm -hmm. in one of the subjects, CGIR came as one of the topics. We studied about CGIR, we studied contribution for addressing the global food security. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, if this is one of the factors. If you see, there's a lot of things happening, like right now, COVID is happening. So people are worried about the COVID. Mm -hmm. A lot of things are there right now, but in the other hand, if you speak people like you, me, and if we talk right now, we are addressing COVID, but another challenge which government also addressing the food. If mm -hmm. we stop everything, 
will not have food to eat tomorrow right. and just as in when everything was closed government allowed farmers government mm-hmm. allowed agriculture companies government allowed seed companies that you need, you are one of the essential services you need to keep on working those mm-hmm. because if we keep on completely this is a major challenge global challenge not india or anything everybody but in apart from this agriculture is thing because as soon as we have come out of this we don't want to face the situation famine can say we oh, we have so much big population but we don't have food to feed all this big population so this is one of the important of thing and then when i started do my phd i got to an opportunity to get in touch with dr rajiv mm-hmm. and he became kind of me because i started doing my phd in chikpi so then i contacted him we started work together and i learned a lot from him and he is one of my idol if i i learned a lot from him and then i said okay ek is the place where i need to go and then as soon as i did my phd he asked me to join him i joined and it was kind of dream come true mm-hmm. and for past 9 years i am here now mm-hmm. working with you guys sitting with you <laughs> it's wonderful sir <laughs> sir uh, sir in the era of uh, big data and artificial intelligence how do we progress with respect to modern research and its field applications thanks for mind this is i think when we talk about this in modern science and everybody is talking about the artificial intelligence and no doubt these are important technologies which have a huge potential to make dent and they are already making dent if you see they are helping in fact even the farmers in decision making and even governments are trying to use those technologies if you see one of the thing soil card government gives this kind of this kind of thing you can think when we are talking about big data kind of thing was difficult mm-hmm. to do it. now farmers can use this sophisticated data set for the weather prediction kind of thing and then you so they can make informed decision about the markets also mm-hmm. so when you have the historical data of oh, weather is going to be there and then what kind of weather, crop production effect will be there what kind of demand will come mm-hmm. if these kinds we plan to implement for, right now things are available bits and pieces but if we do it in more precise manner more planned way this can definitely harm farmers mm. to do it in a better way use the technology by providing local weather prediction or by providing like early detection system for the different pests like diseases if mm. you see recently there was a issue of those insects which were coming from pakistan to india because those data things they we were able yes. to Yeah, yeah. locals. We were trying to okay. This this direction they are going to do, and the farmers and governments are already ready. Mm. That what kind of major ways? This is definitely a scope, and we should government is making, but we need to have more focused way. In this mm-hmm. All right, um, sir. Uh, along with uh, food security, what are your thoughts on nutritional security? Yes, as you might have seen, this is one of my favorite topics: yes. nutrition. <laughs> and uh, i always pitch in because when we talk about nutrition everybody comes oh, malnutrition comes first thing in the mind mm-hmm. but people think malnutrition okay only the people who don't get nutrition mm-hmm. which is a wrong perception malnutrition alone is not that scarcity of nutrition rather it's excessive nutrition is also in malnutrition if right. you see people are there sit as of under nutrition when you people like underweight stunting and wasting the thing which i explained Mm-hmm. and then another kind of malnutrition is obesity right because they get more of those things overweight this is also a kind of nutrition mm-hmm. and then third is becomes then when you get food mm-hmm. but that doesn't have those micronutrient link nutrition mm-hmm. and if you see today's stats because i was working on some of the proposal in last week on this nutrition thing mm-hmm. so i had some of them more than 2 billion people are suffering from this malnutrition Which mm-hmm. is known as hidden hunger globally, mm-hmm. and hunger. some of the data I was I was seeing the data. This is most affected the women, mm-hmm. the pregnant women, and the yes. child. Yes. And when one side we say the child are future. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we need to see together those things. And every year, and if you see this global hunger index which I presented, mm-hmm. now they don't talk about the availability of food. Mm-hmm. They talk about availability of nutrition food. Nutrition, yeah. Food is right. the most nutrition for me is one of the important factor, mm-hmm. and. there needs to be focus effort Definitely. and another thing which uh, at least i know about government of india not uh, outside what 
everybody is doing hmm. and we know in india there is a mid day meal scheme right right and government is started to moving from cereal based diet earlier they used to give just rice and all those things now they are giving pulses hmm. together with this thing hmm. this will help to provide nutrition to those kids who are going to think so hmm. this is a big push from government also yes definitely definitely uh, sir according to you which sectors of plant science research will prosper in the near future mm, very difficult question to answer for now think to me all the see ultimately like we have to be working of the bringing food like some of the data if what i present in if you see when you read mm. by 2050 Hmm. there are clear case that we need to double our production food production definitely so breeding has to be in the focus hmm. we have to give varieties which are high yielding hmm. because we cannot increase field field is remaining stagnant we cannot increase beyond in fact yes. we are reducing with the time hmm. population is increasing so we are cutting more forests we are converting them into for the living thing hmm. so we ultimately we have to increase productivity we have to keep alternate way of crops we have to go for the short crops Hmm. So some of the ideas which, like you mentioned, big data, big data addition, when is we or the important thing to make the wise decision, hmm. calculated decision, what the farmer should be growing, how it should be growing, and the thing for this thing like integrated breeding is important. Hmm. Another thing will be speed breeding. You might have seen hmm. the one of the lean key. Hmm. And one of the major factor which for some of the thing we cannot do this. CRISPR technology is another important aspect, but. always challenge comes that government policy hmm. even if you develop that uh, those crops using those crispr or gm technologies whether government accept or not but these are the need of the time we have to look, look hmm. forward hmm. yeah. all right uh, sir uh, in conclusion uh, what would be your words of advice be to the young research fellows out there so this means you already said that i am old <laughs> no. see you have more experience <laughs> no no you are very young sir no no <laughs> no just job we are job apart <laughs> but i think most of the people who are joined here are either the research fellow in the agriculture field or the plant science so many times we don't recognize like mm. the importance of field we are in agriculture and it's one of the important sector especially in indian globally it contributes a huge to the gdp of india mm. and in fact if you see pm's five trillion economy dream that we want to be five trillion economy last week i think somewhere he said that if you have to be five trillion economy agriculture will have to play a major role mm. we cannot be a five trillion economy without agriculture so agriculture students they have huge big area to work mm. big future to work only thing we need to start thinking about the innovation we should stop working about that routine thing if we keep on we have to start working a different think differently doing differently mm. think innovatively and research innovation lead not of patience in the definitely. era of social networking social media people think oh it's everything cooks and thing and you do no you have to a lot of patience mm. you have to a patient plus if you are patient as well a patient then only you should come in the research Mm-hmm. and you are going to contribute in one of the major challenge of world which is food mm-hmm. and for me it will be satisfying if i'll feel my work can bring a smile to a farmer that will be most satisfying thing for me wow and that will i suggest to the mm-hmm. very wonderfully said <laughs> beautiful your presentation was amazing sir and uh, your all the agriculture fellows will be very happy to hear your, your words of en- encouragement um okay uh, let's go back to shuva now thank you thank you shuma thank you sir uh, as shuma says presentation wise it's uh, is a lovely because there is lot of uh, lot of data driven presentation so understanding this delta and relate to the general mass uh, that why this data is important otherwise it's very hard to know about the high true food data and and uh, we have to learn it because it is uh, going to be a one of the future of plant sciences and i am very much thankful to you that you contribute in uh, hidden hunger and this this and the uh, uh, food security issues because uh, uh, food is also important uh, as nutrition uh, 
uh, nutrition security. So uh, uh, this is this is a wonderful presentation. Uh, I thanks from my team, uh, from Neha, Jacinta, Liberty, Shoma. Uh, you you join us, and uh, you will I will send you all the uh, logistic like how many people are attending, how many uh, people are uh, joining for today's live webinar, and uh, uh, I also give the certificate uh, for every attendees. Uh, it's it's about one thousand. I, I got 1009 registration for the feedback and uh, certificate, but obviously viewers are more than that because these are the certificate, those are the needed the certificate. Uh, and these uh, talk will be available in our YouTube and we also uh, clip it and uh, after two, three days, I shared you all the details, uh, but definitely by tonight, I send you the registrations and others and data. Uh, thank you, sir, for- Thank you, Shoma. Thank you, Neha, and thanks, Shoma. Thanks, Jinta. Thank you. So nice thank to you, be here with you. It was wonderful to talk to you guys. And this, congrats to you guys. You have made a big team, very strong team of a big, wide reach. All the, my all the best. Thank you. Thank sir. you so thank much. You, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. I want to thank my team, uh, Jacinda, mm -hmm. uh, Neha, and Soma for joining. Uh, and we successfully completed our 16 webinar. Now we'll, we meet again on 5th. There is a, a panel discussion and soft skill. This is a little bit different, but we also uh, also enter, uh, we also concerned uh, and we love to uh, spread this knowledge in this platform about the soft skill because it's very related to our work and our personal and professional balance. Uh, so thanks, team Brian Jane. How to move? How to do This is the password 98235. I hope everyone get it because I am multiple time I pasted in the YouTube chat box and this 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 is the link and uh, I'm going to end this webinar uh, with the note that we we have a two Uptime webinars on this month, September 2020, on 5th and 12th. For the 5th webinar, it's uh, 10 a.m. Indian Standard Time. It's a little bit earlier, generally one hour earlier. Uh, so uh, be be uh, remind, uh, be set the reminder on your mobile and uh, calendar. And another webinar is on 12th on the. Uh, uh, CISPR, uh, it is it is as a result 11 a.m. Uh, 11 a.m. Indian Standard Time. So uh, let let's uh, see. Uh, in uh, we are we are very happy that you all guys uh, joined today, and uh, I'm a little bit uh, worried that many many people are going to mail me about the password because. I saw a tendency to attend the webinar at the end, but it's not a right way because many international women are not giving the certificate. We giving the certificate to encourage you, but it has to be a proper way. It's not that uh, you come at the end and getting the certificate. I change a little bit, but if you require, then I keep the link first and password at the last. If it is also work, not work, then I stop the giving the certificate. So knowledge is free for everybody. We are not taking money for that. Then we are not reliable and bound to be given the certificate. So it's not a certificate collection for platform. 
please remind it, come for the knowledge. We are very happy to get it all over the world. We're getting recognized or oh, many people are attached to it, bioengine webinar. And it's a throughout process. It's a year wise process. So it's not a particular certificate you have missed or don't worry, don't worry about the certificate. If you collect a thousand certificate in the lockdown, then how you manage it? How you send the certificate in your CV if it is 1000 certificate and who will get the certificate uh, to read that, okay, you attend the thousand webinar. It is better to learn out of thousand, only 10 webinar and the concept of it. Our webinar is a research driven webinar. So there is a lot of data. You have to process it. You have to learn this data. And if you attend the webinar, you got the certificate. There is a no problem on that. Thank you. This is the end of the webinar. Yeah.